Hey there, my name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors at Hope City. I'm really glad you're checking out this week's message. I hope you'll take a minute, look around our website, visit our YouTube channel, and download the Hope City app by searching Hope City Indy in the App Store or Google Play Store. There's great content on the app that goes far beyond weekend services. Hope City is a place where you can belong before you believe. No matter where you come from today spiritually, I hope this message helps you find hope and move closer to Jesus. Enjoy the message. Well, hey, Hope City, how's everyone doing? <laughs> Happy Sunday. Thanks for those of you who are joined us in person. It's been so fun to see people come back. It's been awesome. For those of you who are online, we are so grateful that you have joined us. If this is your first time with us, my name is Trish Davis. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, I just realized that I drank a cup of coffee and I'm like ready. So like whether you're here or you're at home, if you've had your coffee and you're ready, I'm excited to dive in today's message. So welcome. Uh, if you have been around the past couple of weeks, we have been in this series called Befriend that was birthed out of this book by our friend and pastor Scott Saul. He's a pastor in Nashville, Tennessee. And when we decided uh, to do this book in this study together as a church, I knew, I just knew that God would just usher in a much needed hope. A hope to befriend one another in our families, in our communities, at our schools, what it means to befriend. And I just want to say, church, thank you. Thank you for your willingness to be a part of this collective movement of finding hope and how to befriend one another um, as we move into uh, this new season that I hope for not only our church, but for our community at large. If you've missed any of the weeks, I want to encourage you. We launched that little podcast called Hope Changes Everything, and on the podcast has all of our messages, so you can listen to them on your way to work or to your short little distance to your home office, or you can get on YouTube. But please, 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 I want to encourage you to listen to each of the weeks as we talk about what it means to be friend. Now, if you were here last week, the message that I'm giving today was what I was supposed to speak last week. But because of Justin getting COVID, which was fun, and then our family being quarantined together, more fun, lots of fun, um, I could not be here. So I asked Micah, our oldest son with three days novice, and I was like, hey, dude, do you think you could speak for me? And what he could have done is just gone to his arsenal of messages. He's a youth pastor at a church here in Carmel, Carmel called Northview. But instead, he said that he felt like God had given him a specific word for our church family. And as I listened to him last week, as he was speaking, I was like, yes. And like, not because I'm his mom, which I was pretty proud of him. Because Micah was giving me language I didn't know that I didn't have. This idea of living a curious life that leads to befriending others with compassion. And then he went on to share about how Jesus was the master of this. Jesus was the master of being curious with his questions. And as he asked questions, then he would give another gift. He would give the gift of listening. And in his listening, his response was always from a posture of compassion. I thought, man, this curiosity. Just Micah reminded us that curiosity doesn't expand just our faith and our knowledge But it has this profound impact on how we befriend others that are not like us. And I began a journey of curiosity about five years ago on a a topic that has hit home to people that call Hope City home. And a topic that has affected people outside of our community. And in my curiosity, I began to grow in my compassion to understand that as a pastor and as a church family, we needed to have this conversation, the conversation about racial reconciliation. 
And I realize when we take a deep dive into this topic that I'm already starting with tensions. Listen, in the 20 plus years that I've been a part of the church, I've been a part of ministry, this last year has grown me in what it means to be criticized. I have been criticized more this year than I ever have in all the other 20 years combined. And and it's not anything against anyone. It's just been a hard year. We're just trying to sort a lot of things out. So mask or no mask. Church or no in-person church. I've experienced it all. We, we, We have all been there. All different perspectives. And what this past year has taught me is that I had to make a choice. I would either choose to be bitter or I would choose to be better. And I chose the latter. And in that choosing, I decided I want to be more like Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He made room. He made space. He listened. And as your pastor, that's what I have devoted myself to. It's what Justin has devoted himself to over this past year is to create room, to create space for you to feel all the feels. Because here's the truth. We will never, ever be 100% on the same page on every single aspect of our lives at every single moment in time. How do I know this? Because I've been married for 25 plus years, right? There are things, I love my man, I deeply love him, but there are some things I'm like, dude, come on, the toilet paper goes out, not in, I mean, come on, right? There's things that we are going to agree to disagree with. So what I want you to know is that our Willingness to have a conversation today isn't for me to try to convince you to think like me. That is not my role as a pastor. My role as a pastor is to encourage you into the word of God through his scriptures. To encourage you into corporate prayer. To encourage you into corporate worship. To encourage you to grow closer to the heart of God and allow the Holy Spirit to transform in only a way that he can. So, if you are tempted to log off, I get it. If you are tempted to kind of like sit with your arms crossed and, and feel a little frustrated, I understand. But can I plead with you to hang in there with me today? Would you allow curiosity to lead with compassion? Today, can we hold space for one another? If you find yourself on the top of, a, of racial reconciliation, feeling like you don't get it, you don't understand it, maybe the term racial reconciliation is a trigger for you as a person of color, would you be willing to be curious with me today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this space today. And we know that you meet us right where we are at. And so we are going to trust you for that in this conversation. Open our hearts, open our minds to you today. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so over the series, we've been doing this little thing called This or That. Uh, we've been doing like this or that movies, which movies you like more. Last week, Micah did like um, This or That Friends. Like, what are the movies that you like? These unlikely friendships birthed out of curiosity, The Lion King, Timon and Pumbaa, we went on and on. But today, I just have one question. This is my one question. Who, you can put this in the chat, yes or no, are my fans of Target? Who are my fans of Target? Wow, there's like, okay, that was sad. Who are my friends of Target? Who loves Target? Somebody give me a holler. Thank you. I love Target. I don't know why. I don't know how it happened. I am certain that there is a psychological issue, uh, you know, disorder when it comes to Target. I, I call it the Target effect that somehow when I walk into Target, I just feel happy. I feel happy. And Target is known for, like, its red circle. And when I see the red circle, I feel happy. And when I walk in the, hall, the aisles and I see the red signs, I feel happy. And y'all, you know that I am a professed minimalist. I own very little clothes. So you'll get bored watching my messages. You're like, man, she just keeps wearing that over and over again. But when I get into Target, something happens. I'm like, I need that. I need, I need to purchase that. It's on sale. So this one particular time I went to Target, and I had a laser-like focus. I needed something, and I walked in. I couldn't find it. And so what do you do when you can't find something at Target? You find somebody who has a what-colored shirt on? A red shirt. So I'm like, okay, I need to find someone with a red shirt. Lo and behold, a couple aisles later, there was someone in a red shirt, an employee. So I began to ask this woman. She was like in her mid-50s, and I was like, hey, I'm trying to find such and such. Do you know where it would be? And she was like, mm. I mean, she was in the conversation with me. 
She was thinking through. She knew the aisles just like I did. And then she said, well, I mean, I don't work here, but I think, I was like, listen, if you come to Target with a red shirt on, you have an issue. Like, you should know that people are going to ask you questions. But we see this example all throughout our, our, our communities in, in our everyday life. When you go to the doctors and there's a person that walks in and they have a lab coat on and they have a stethoscope around their neck and they walk into the examination room, you know it is the, the doctor. People online help me out, right? It's the doctor. If you see someone in fatigues, you know that they are probably in, uh, in, in the armed services, if you see a woman who has an all black like gown robe on and she has a headdress on that has a white strip across it bearing a rosary, she is most likely a... Yes! Yeah, there we go. Like our perception of one another, how we perceive one another always begins with the outward appearance. Right, it's what we use to answer questions like... Is this, is this person familiar? Do I have anything in common with this person? Is this person safe? Right? We use our outside appearance. Our perception begins with an outside appearance. And we have seen this in the past couple years. That if you are wearing a red hat that says, make America great again, you are giving the appearance, the perception that you are for a certain political party or you are for a certain political figure. If you put a hat on that says Black Lives Matter, you are making and giving the perception that you are for black lives. You are for social injustice issues. Right? Our perception of one another begins in how we see one another. And this isn't like a, a unique phenomenon to America but our biases, our constructs, they come from a multitude of factors, but it always begins with perception. And if you're anything like me, the words like ethnicity and nationality and race and culture, I kind of take all of those words and I put them all together to try to explain myself. Like my dad's Hispanic, my mom is like, I don't know, I think she's German, Irish, something, Swedish, I don't know. Just that mixture, and I try to explain, like, I grew up with Hispanic culture, and I, I don't even know. And so maybe you're like me. When we even start talking about the topic of racial reconciliation, you're like, I don't even know the right words. A lady by the name uh, Lisa Sharon Harper, she's an author and founder of um, a ministry called Freedom Road, where she literally comes alongside people to have this conversation. And she did such a beautiful job creating a way for us to understand kind of these different facets that we perceive in one another, our perception. And she says this, ethnicity was created by God. Groups, people groups move through space and time. This is the, the Genesis effect. This is what it says in Genesis is then God said, let us make human beings in the image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth, and the small animals that scurry along ugh, out of the ground. So God created human beings in his own, say it with me, image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So when we go back, that's right, sweet baby, saying it from there. Ethnicity is our ethos. It's who God created us to be. We are image bearers of God. And then you have culture. And culture is the sociological, the anthropological, anthropological, gosh, say that three times, terms that refers to the beliefs, the norms, rituals, arts, and worldviews of particular people, groups, and particular places at a particular time. A better way to understand culture is uh, how many of you are a, a child of the 80s? Right, like I was, let us know in the chat when, what, what, where you grew up, 80s, 70s. I, I was born in the 70s. I'm a child of the 80s, which is some kind of special. Right, I became a teenager in the 90s, and I have grown my family in the 2000s. So when I think of culture, I think of just in 10 years how much has changed through those different decades. 
Our culture is defined by our beliefs, our norms, our rituals, our arts. And then you have nationality, and I feel like this one is the easiest to kind of reconcile. Nationality indicates the sovereign nation or state where an individual is a legal citizen. And so if you are a legal citizen of the United States, therefore you are an American. And if you're anything like me, what has happened in my lack of understanding when it comes to uh, racial issues is that I assumed the meaning of race was in in equal parts of ethnicity, nationality, and culture. But look what it says. This is how Lisa describes it. Race is about power in political terms in dominion. As a political construct, race was created by humans to determine who can exercise power within a governing structure and to guide decisions regarding how to allocate resources. I was like, whoa. I, I, I don't think I ever made the word race separate from ethnicity and culture and nationality. And as I began to get curious and I began reading everything under the sun, I found this book. It's called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. I actually um, found out about Emmanuel Acho through a, not a podcast, it was like a YouTube channel that he started over the past like two years just having conversations with white people. And literally they would dialogue about these, these questions that we, we, the gap in our culture Now, you may have heard of Emmanuel because I just learned that he is now the host of The Bachelor. And this is either going to make you very proud or you're going to be disappointed in me. I've never watched one episode of The Bachelor. I don't know. It stresses me out. So there you go. But now Emmanuel is the the lead person on it. But he, over the past two years, he is a former NFL player. He has not been on the front lines of talking about racial reconciliation, but what he did is he began a conversation. And these conversations took off. People were leaning in and they were listening. And in his book, he says this about race. He says, when the first Africans arrived in 1619 in Virginia, there was no such thing as a white person. As far as the law is concerned, white people as a race didn't exist until 1681. Why? Why did we go, even in the beginning of slavery, did we not talk about this issue? Then he goes on to say this. He says, it wasn't until 1681 when colonial American lawmakers sought out to outlaw marriages between European people and others. Before that, people were known by their nation of origin. So so there was no construct for race. It was just, where are you from? He goes on to say that anti-miscegenation laws, the law prohibiting Europeans from marrying and having children with people of African descent, forged the white race. Human-made to determine human importance. That is race. And to begin the journey of compassionate curiosity and understanding systemic racism, we have to be willing to acknowledge the complexities of our American history. Our American history when it comes to ethnicity and culture and nationality and yes, race. And when we start asking these questions about racial reconciliation today, what we're specifically talking about is systemic racism. Uh, Pastor Rich uh, Vilotis, he is, um, wrote a book called The Deeply Informed Life, and he is a pastor of a a long-standing church. He took over this church from the founding pastor when he was 30. He is now in his 40s. And his church sits in the heart of Queens, New York. And it's a multicultural church. And he talks about all the issues, the exact same issues that we're talking about today. And he says this about racism. He says, at the core of racism is the lie that some people are superior or inferior to others. 
To grow in our understanding of racial reconciliation, we first have to acknowledge that there are racial biases that exist in America today. In our communities, in our schools, in our government, and even in our churches. I want you to take a look at a picture that I think helps understand why the conversation is so intense. For 339 years, the history of America has had slavery. 339 years. And so if you are a person of color, if you are a black person descended from Africa, taken as a slave, you came to the United States not as a person but a piece of property to be sold and to be bought and to be owned. And it wasn't until 1865 where that began to change. And I wish we had time. The, the segregation, these 89 years, are full of a lot of rich and hard, hard um, history. I would really encourage you to learn about these years. But what I want to focus on is 1954. 1954. Why is this important? Why is it a need for us to see this laid out in this way? Because the history of freedom is much shorter than the history of bondage. And so to acknowledge racial reconciliation, we have to declare that not only it exists, we have to acknowledge our call as Christians to engage in this conversation. Look at what Jesus says in the book of Mark. He says, one of the scribes, a scribe is like a really smart dude who knew a lot about Jewish tradition and law uh, of the Old Testament. And one of these scribes approached this scene where Jesus is talking to a whole bunch of other scribes. And they're just throwing a whole bunch of different things at him to answer, to try and trap him. And when the scribe heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well, he then asked him this question. Which command is the most important of all? And then Jesus answers with this. The most important is, listen, Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. Now, I don't know about you. I have read this a million times. And that's exaggerating, but I've read it a lot. And when I read it, I always, always come to verse 31 to love your neighbor as yourself. But when I began to get curious, when I began to understand that our world operates in these constructs that I've often missed most my adult life, I realized that Jesus was specifically speaking into his culture. He says to them, Jesus answered, the most important is listen, Israel. To listen, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In those days, what Jesus was saying was the Shema. And the Shema was this prayer that the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. It was a prayer that was prayed in the morning and it was praying in the evening, prayed in the evening. And Jesus starts to answer the question, what is the greatest command? And he says, listen, when you display the Shema, when you bring your prayers, what you are declaring as a scribe is that what we can believe, what we perceive about you is that you love God. Love our God. Our God is one. But Jesus begins to speak into the tensions of his own ethnic and cultural biases. He used the language of his culture, the Shema, and then he got radical. Because it didn't stop there. He goes, and then. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now that might sound really like familiar to us today in our church. But in those days, it was a brand new concept. 
then Jesus says in the book of Acts in chapter 1, verse 8, he tells us his disciples to be his witnesses, to go and tell everybody about this good news that I have died and I've resurrected to give new life and to create a new family. And he says, I want you to go everywhere, to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria. And what he is saying in those words is a lot what many of us feel and think depending on where you are politically, depending on where you are and on, on understanding racial tension. That Samaria was so far from Jerusalem in their beliefs and what they were on the same page with. It was such a disagreement. So when Jesus said to love your neighbor and then he said to go to not just Jerusalem but to Samaria, Jesus, he, it was revolutionary. And Jesus, he was an activist. And I know that word is like, maybe sits wrong with some of you. But Jesus advocated. He was an activist for the oppressed, for the marginalized. Jesus was an advocate for the doubters and even the haters. When you start to understand his, his guys that he hung out with, the disciples that were part of his inner circle, they were all over the place. They should have hated each other. Some of them on just two totally different perspectives. But Jesus, he was an advocate for peace and inclusion and in love. Why? Because at the heart of the gospel is giving all people the dignity God gave us in the garden and reconciled on the cross. Reconciliation is the heart of the gospel Scott Saul says it this way, we love others not in spite of our Christianity, but because of our Christianity. Now I want to take a time out. I want you to remember that today is one of many conversations, right? There's no book ending today. We've been talking about racial reconciliation issues at Hope City since our second week we opened as a church four years ago. And so what I want you to do is I want you to take a deep breath with me. And I just want you to breathe in God's truth that we were all created in God's image. And I want you to exhale grace. To exhale a grace to know that today we are getting curious. My friend Latasha Morrison, um, she wrote a book, but she started a ministry called Be the Bridge. And I didn't know Latasha until I met her at a conference, and she, I, she's just a powerhouse. I really like her. And this was before she even started her ministry, Be the Bridge. And she started talking about this whole area of, of racial reconciliation. And I'm thinking, man, I grew up in a, a home, you know, like I, I grew up in a city that was multicultural. And then as she, she started talking, I was like, whoa. She says this about racial reconciliation. She said, it's a lifestyle. It's not just reading a book or listening to a podcast or financially supporting an organization. It's a lifelong commitment to see beyond the filter bubble. How many of you have heard of the filter bubble before? I know that I haven't, but the filter bubble is when the algorithms of your life through all your social media happen to know that you are a fan of Target. And then they taunt you and they show you Target ads come up in your feed and things from Target that you don't need. And the filter bubble in this day and age, it pays attention that if you are for a certain voice, if you are for a, a, a certain aspect of, of culture, it just bombards you with just that. And before you know it, you have been put into a filter bubble that you no longer see beyond just what you like. You no longer see beyond what you think is different. And when I began to think about my filter bubble, I agonized over the fact that I grew up in a house with a brown-skinned daddy in Hispanic culture. I went to a school that was multi-ethnic, multicultural. Like, people would bring baklava, and I learned about Hanukkah. I mean, it was just like, just what we did. So how did I... You guys, how did I miss it? And I did. I missed all of it. And I had to come to a place in my grief that I had to accept the gift 
the silver lining in my upbringing because in my upbringing, I was just living out Genesis that I, I thought all people belonged to God. I thought they were all important because I had people of color in different prominent areas of my life. But when I began to continue to get curious, I realized that that was not true for the history of not only our American history, but the history of the church. And for me, it began with a picture that hung on my wall since I was a little girl. You may know this picture. It's called The Head of Christ. It's a 1940s painting by American artist from Chicago named Warren Salmon. And for centuries, Europeans have depicted Jesus as lighter and lighter skin as the centuries went by. But this rendition was different. This rendition of Jesus, his hair was flowy. His eyes were possibly blue. He's a pretty man. It's like a side picture. And from my Catholic side of my family to the Protestant side of my family, we all had this same Jesus hanging up in our homes. Over 500 million copies were hung in childhood homes of this picture. So what is the issue? A, a Dutch artist a couple years ago, I'm not even going to attempt to say his name. I, I just not. Um, but he decided to uh, discover what he thinks Jesus may have looked like. And so what he did is he used artificial intelligence. I mean, welcome to 2021. And he began putting paintings and statues and icons, any information he could find about what people may have looked like in the days of Jesus. And look at the difference. This is the 1940s picture and this is the Dutch dude that I don't know how to say his name. And as I look at it, this rendering, uh, he will tell you that the artificial intelligence actually gave Jesus long hair. But as he began to study and dive in a little bit more and a little bit more, he realized that Jesus probably had short hair. And so why does this matter? Why does this matter? Why does the striking difference matter? And this is where it's going to get hard. And this is where I'm going to ask you just to hold space. This is where I'm going to ask you to receive it not as a condemnation, but as information. But in the 1940s, to be a white male meant you were a position of power. And remember, how we perceive one another is how we receive one another. The wider Jesus became, the more we had in common with him. The more we could understand his power. The more we could connect that he probably could be the savior of the world. This is often referred to as whitewashing. But if we want to truly get back to the Genesis passage where we're willing to have that curiosity that leads to compassion, we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to accept the Jesus who was a first century Middle Eastern Jew who spoke zero English? Would we receive that? You see, you will have to fight the filter bubbles of your life. Bubbles that you may not even know that you are in because our perception of people always starts from the outward appearance. When we adopted our son and daughter, Jalen and Janaya, it'll be five years ago now, four years ago, five years, I don't know. Um, I, my brother-in-law is African-American. Uh, my, my nephews are mixed and one of them I think looks Puerto Rican. The other one is definitely, I call him my um, dark chocolate. I just love him. Um, he's got like crazy hair. And so I, I felt like I knew about black culture. And so when we adopted Jalen and Janiah, this is what her hair looks like. And she's so cute. And I, I was like in love. You guys, I am such a girly girl. I have waited my whole life to have a girl. And so the night that we brought them home, we actually had to bring them to a hotel. We weren't allowed to bring them to our house just yet. And she asked me if we could let her hair out. And I was like, you can have anything you want. Yes, you can let your hair out. So she lets her hair out. And I was like, whoa, right? And I was like, this is going to be incredible. 
And so the next day I go and I take my brush and I try to do her hair and I realize that I, I don't know how to do her hair. And I was like, I got to get curious quick or baby girl is going to have wild hair for the rest of her life. And so I did. I started to get curious and I started asking my, my black friends, my, my black girlfriends, like I, I had no idea. And then I started going to a salon of, of all black women and they just loved on me and they taught me how to, to take care of her hair. They taught me how to braid her hair. And do, now I'm obsessed with it and I want to open my own salon, but I won't. Like, it, it, but as I began to listen as I began to continue to get curious, I started to hear something that I did not know was there. That black hair isn't just black hair. I found these pictures on Instagram by Vibes of a Black Girl. It's called The Pencil Test, and I started reading it, and I was like, what is going on? I, I was like, oh my gosh, does that really say what I think it says? In 1948 and 1994, I graduated from high school in 1993. Between 1948 and 1944, or 1994, the pencil test was the method used to assessing whether a person was white or black. A pencil was slid into the hair of someone being assessed. If the pencil fell out, you were white, and if it stayed in, you were black. This was a tool used to segregate people and stop them from attending functions, schools. I bet church should probably be connected to that and events. And then it says not only did this cause racial division, it tore families apart. I cannot perceive that in 1994, if baby girl was part of my life, that she could not go to a function with me because the pencil didn't fall out of her hair. But I continued to get curious. And as I did, I understood why black hair is not just black hair. Black hair was a map to freedom. Cornrows have a rich history in black communities. Slaves would braid escape routes into their hair. They were used for a way for slaves to communicate to one another without their slave owners knowing. Some of the cornrows and the number of plates worn would let them know how far they needed to travel or how many roads they needed to walk till they would be able to meet one another to escape. The map to freedom it was also a means to survival. The black women who came before us were innovative and showed that the thickness and the texture of black hair was valuable and had purpose. This is because slaves would braid rice and seeds into their cornrows before journeying the middle passage. You can look up what that means. Enslaved mothers would also braid seeds. As a mom, I really, 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 really struggled with this one. Mothers would also braid seeds in their children's hair so they could eat in case they were separated due to slave auctions. And you may be thinking, Trish, this is old history. Like, I understand the Black Lives Matter movement, and I understand that the, the tensions. According to the beauty brand Dove, black women are 50% more likely to be sent home, adult women, adult black women are more likely to be sent home from work because of their hairstyle and 80% are more likely to change their hair by straightening or relaxing it so that they can be accepted by their peers. Church, this is systemic racism. In 2019, just three years ago, California had to pass a law, and they were the first to pass a law called the Crown Act, standing for create a respectful and open workplace for natural hair. We're talking three years ago that our brothers and sisters in Christ that we need to have a law developed so that they cannot be discriminated for the hair that God gave him, created in the image he created. This is systemic racism. Listen to these powerful words spoken by Peter in the book of Acts. It says, then Peter replied, I see very clearly 
that God shows no favoritism, I, I would encourage you to read this whole chapter. There's a huge, crazy backstory. And he comes to this conclusion that God shows no favoritism in every nation. He except those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of the good news for the people of Israel. That there is peace with God through Jesus Christ who is our Lord. Pastor Rich goes on to say in his book that God is not simply in the business of saving souls. He is in the business of creating a family. And this family, Hope City Church, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. In this family, we're going to be willing to have a deep love and respect for each other. In this family, I pray that we recognize that we are not going to be exactly the same, but we come from the exact same God. I pray that at the core of who we are, we will be called to lavishly love with our curious questions that lead to compassion. Jamar Tisby, he's an author, and I actually don't have the book that really sparked all of this in me because I keep giving it away, but it's called The Color of Compromise, and why it hit me so hard is because this book is specific to church history and slavery and racial injustice. And then he wrote a book, pretty simple, How to Fight Racism. It's just, just simple. And he gives practical tools of how to get curious, how to be courageous in your Christianity and the journey towards racial justice. And then he just gives this, this simple, this is not a formula. This is a process. In today, church, what we are doing is we're just becoming aware. We're choosing to be aware of the issues for our fellow people of color since the time of the COVID virus, the last statistic that I have read for Asian Americans, because of the false belief, the perception that COVID was due to Asian people, the amount of brutality towards the Asian community has gone up 1,900%. We have to choose to be aware we have to choose to commit. And how does that happen? Through relationships. It happens through relationships. So I want to ask you today, church, will you choose to befriend in ways that may be outside of your comfort zone? Church, would you be willing to befriend in ways that make this world look more like heaven on this side of heaven? Would you be willing to be in the scriptures, in books, and listen to the voices of people of color, not for condemnation, but to live in the freedom to get back to the original call to love your neighbor? So here's what I want to do as we close. I know that these are hard these are hard questions. This is a hard topic, but I believe in our church. You guys, are, you guys are crazy with your love. You are crazy with your financial giving. You are crazy with your service. And I know that I know that I know that you are going to be audaciously crazy in understanding how to love the people of color within our Hope City community and outside. And so I want to give you a commitment piece. I want to give you a starting place. And I believe everything starts with prayer. So I'm going to invite, um, Glory is a, a good friend of mine. You've seen Glory lead uh, worship for us. Uh, Glory is actually, she's a phenomenal, phenomenal leader. But she has recently um, come on as one of the elders of Hope City Church. I know, well, yeah, come on. And this woman is full of wisdom. We have cried together. We have um, prayed together. We've gotten each other's faces like, you know, get out of it. Let's pray it up. And so I couldn't think of a better person to close this time together. And I want I wanted to spend time in prayer. And I wish that it was a, a longer experience. But I, I pray that these prayers that we are going to pray, you take with, the, with you. Continue to allow them to make you curious. 
And these prayers aren't a posture of thumbing you down. They are from a posture to lift you up, to be the friend that Christ was us on the cross, to be that same friend to those around us. And so the prayers are going to be um, up on the screen. If you're at home, it's going to be a full screen. And just ask you to, we're going to read them, give you a small amount of time to pray. And then each, every prompt, we're, we're going to say a prayer after, before we close in worship. So let, let's start our journey to awareness by identifying. Ask God to reveal to make aware the areas of racial, religious, political, gender, and cultural prejudice that you find yourself battling in your everyday life. So take a moment and ask God to reveal that, reveal that to you. Father, we come before you like David did in Psalm 139. We say, search me, search me thoroughly, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know if there be any anxious way in me. And see if there's anything wicked or hurtful in my ways and lead me to your everlasting way. God, you always make room for us to come back to your heart, which is that we are one, that you created each of us in your image. So God, I ask that you would make us aware of those things in our lives that prevent us from loving our brother and our sister. Those prejudices that allow us, Lord, to make assumptions of someone else before they even open their mouth. God, in this moment, Lord, search our hearts. Search each of us, Lord, and help us be aware of these things. Because only then can we be able to confess. Only then can we move to that next step, Lord. As we identify we move into a place of confession. Share with God the ways your biases have caused, whether knowingly or unknowingly, to cause harm towards another person of color. Let's pray. I confess that even being a person who is passionate about loving all people well, I confess I didn't know. I don't know if I didn't want to know or if I didn't want to see it. But for each of us today, whether we're online in our living rooms or in our car driving or we're here in the church building, we, we give it to you and we trust that you are such a safe person who holds space for us and receives the confession and is wild with a compassionate response. Next we're going to repent. Ask God to forgive you for your blind spots your actions of bias towards others, and to help you seek reconciliation with those that we've hurt. God, as you open our eyes to see as you open our eyes to identify these things, God, we come before you and we repent. We ask, oh God, that you would forgive us 
for the times that we have judged others, for the times that we've made these assumptions, for the times, oh God, where we've acted in defense. God, forgive us. God, purify our hearts. Lord, help us to forgive that we may be forgiven. God, help us, Lord, to receive the repentance that others bring to us, Lord. Make room in our hearts, God, to forgive and to be forgiven. Remove the blind spots, Lord, that hold us down, that prevent us, Lord, from being able to love truly and to be, from being able to be that friend that we need to be to each other that we would love you with all our hearts and as we do so, God, that we would be able to love our brothers and our sisters. So we repent, oh God. Have mercy. Forgive us, Lord. We come to you as a church body. We come to you, Lord, as the body of Christ. In every heart of those who call themselves Christians, God, allow us to take a moment and repent that we will be more like you, Lord. Lastly, I want to give you room to invite God in to this conversation. Ask God to give you the next right step for you personally. And pray that God would surround you with a Latasha. We give you the people that will come around you and help you be the best friend that can be friend to be friend with the love of Jesus, to love like Jesus. It is in his name we pray, amen.